بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله في Just before I go into the text, I wanted to cover a few things about the uh, methodology of <coughs> Imam Malik's school. All of the uh, all of the 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 schools, the four schools, and <coughs> there were many schools when these four were formulated. There was uh, Imam Tabari had a school, uh, Layth had a school, Abu Thawr had a school. Um, there, there, there are many different schools, but for whatever reasons, the the uh, the agreed upon schools became these four schools of uh, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik school, Imam Shafi, and then Ahmed bin Hanbal school, radiyallahu anhum jamian. So the Imam, uh, thank you. Imam Sh- uh, Shafi wrote a, a very important book called the Risala. And in it, he set down a uh, a methodology for interacting with the Quran and with the Sunnah of the Prophet And that methodology, even though he is considered the founder of Usul al-Fiqh, the other ulama were using uh, the methodology. It just hadn't been identified. It's like people speak language and then grammar follows. So. Imam Shafi'i, what he did really was, in the same way that Aristotle codified the rules of logic, it wasn't that people, uh, you'll find logic all through Plato's uh, dialogues with Socrates. He's using syllogisms in his, uh, in, his, um, in his reasoning, but Aristotle was the one that identified and gave it names, minor premise, major premise, conclusion, uh, so you'll see that. So Usul al-Fiqh follows uh, the methodologies that were being used, and they had different methodologies. Uh, but the first and foremost was the uh, the Quran was the primary source for Islamic legislation, and uh, and the second was that the the Sunnah of the Prophet uh, was the the second source, and then uh, the Ijma. Uh, you have the Qiyas and the Ijma'ah. So Qiyas is, is using the Qur'an and the Sunnah and making analogical reasoning. So the ulama divide, for instance, they divide uh, intoxicants uh, and narcotics. You have uh, what are called uh, muskirat, and then you have uh, murqidat, superifics, and then mukhaddirat uh, or mufsidat, which are narcotics. And, and they classified each one of these. So for instance, hashish is not as severe, severe it's, it's, uh, it's not as severe as alcohol in the Islamic continu- continuum, but it's still considered prohibited because yughayyab al-aqal, biduni nashwatan wa tarab, the way the fuqaha say it. it, it, it it causes a clouding of the intellect, but without the same uh, elation and intoxication that you get from alcohol, for instance. So, by analogy then, even though khamar is what's mentioned, and khamar is a muskir, kullu muskiran khamrun wa kullu khamrin haram. You know, every muskir, every intoxicant is a type of khamar. So it doesn't matter if it's from grapes or dates, or barley, it doesn't matter what it's from, it goes under that category. But by analogy, uh, uh, the reason is because of the effect that it has on the intellect, on the aql. So by analogy then, drugs become prohibited. Uh, and that's how they work with the qiyas. And then the ijma' is what is agreed upon. There's a lot of debate about ijma' um, and whether or not there really is an ijma'. But there's definitely an ijma' of the sahaba about certain things. For instance, when Umar ibn al-Khattab mentioned the tahiyya, uh, Ibrahimiyya, um, nobody, nobody objected. So, uh, the, and other examples like that. But the, uh, within the madhabs, there's definitely an agreed upon uh, opinion about things. And then there's also things that all of the ulama are in agreement upon. Uh, for instance, the uh, the prohibition of homosexuality 
That's mujma'ale. There's no khilaf about it. So nobody can come, like there's certain uh, modern people that have written articles that there's, in fact, I saw in a book on Islam that was published in England by somebody saying there's nothing in Islam that condemns homosexuality. I mean, anybody can write whatever they want, but uh, that's mujma'ale. So to deny that then is considered that you're actually outside of Islam. If you deny something that's agreed upon and known out of necessity, like every Muslim knows that. Every Muslim knows alcohol is haram. Uh, it's ma'lum min ad-deen daruratan. It's just necessarily known. Um, then if you deny those things. However, if you deny, for instance, that one fortieth of your wealth is an obligation to give, that's not known by necessity. That, that you have to study fiqh to know that. If you deny zakat, that's one of the five pillars. But the actual amount of the zakat is not known by necessity. So that's just ignorance, and somebody's excused for that type of ignorance um, in terms of takfir. So, but once you get past those four, you, you move into uh, the, 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 um, the areas that are, are uh, there's disagreement about them. And Imam Malik uses certain things that the other Imams don't use. And, and one of them, and this is the most important for you to understand the methodology of the Maliki Madhab, one of them is called the Amal of Ahl al Medina. And Imam Madik considered Medina to have a unique status, that Medina was not like other places. There were 10,000 Sahaba that are buried in Baqiya. Uh, it was the place where Abu Bakr and Omar uh, ruled as caliphs, uh, and Uthman, anhu. So, and part of uh, Imam Ali's Khilafah was there until he moved it to Al Iraq. So Imam Madik considered the, the ulama, the scholars of Medina, to have a unique perspective on things because they did not simply read hadith or study hadith. They actually experienced the practice of Islam as an amal, that they were living Islam. Islam was not something like in books that you studied. It was actually things that people experienced. And there's a famous debate uh, with Imam Malik and one of the uh, Iraqi scholars about the actual amount of the sa'a. And uh, Imam Malik just told somebody in the, in the, uh, that was in the uh, gathering to go get his sa'a, the actual physical cup that he used to measure the grain for zakat. And uh, he, came, he brought it, and then he said, where did you get that? And he said, I got it from my father. And he said, where did he get it from? And he got it from one of the sahaba. So he said, you know, you, you can debate all you want. We have the measuring tools of the Sahaba, you know. And the same with the Adhan. He, he mentioned that um, he wasn't interested about what they said about these things. So that, that aspect of his, uh, his madhab causes confusion for people uh, that when you have a sound hadith and the Malikis say, well, we know that hadith, but we don't follow that hadith. Well, if, if the hadith is sound, then it's my madhab. That's what Imam Shafi'i said. Well, that's true, but Imam Shafi'i left certain hadiths that were sahih because they contradicted other hadiths that were sahih. So it's not absolutely true. What, what Imam Shafi'i was saying is, I'm going to follow the Prophet ﷺ before I follow the opinions of others. Ahmed ibn Hanbal says the same thing. Ahmed ibn Hanbal prefers a weak hadith uh, which more falls into the category of Hassan and his methodology, but he prefers a weak hadith over the opinions of, of people. Abu Hanifa anhu, uh, rejects many, many ahad hadith uh, because they don't follow uh, qawaid that he uh, firmly believes are established in the Quran. So this idea that you just simply follow the hadith without being able to do tamhis or some kind of gharbala uh, uh, of the hadith, you know, where you put it in a sieve and, and uh, sort it out. And, and there's a famous story of Ibn Wahbin, who was one of the great scholars of the Maliki Madhab, and he was, he's also one of the rijal of Imam al-Bukhari. Ibn Wahbin knew uh, just untold numbers of hadith, and he became confused, and he actually said, that he memorized so many contrary hadiths that he tahayyart. You know, he said, I became confused. And he said, but thank God for Malik, because he went to Malik, and he would 
say these hadiths and he'd say, leave that hadith, that hadith, leave that. And he, and he helped him sort out these hadiths. Imam Malik had, uh, Ibn al-Qasim said when after Malik died, he went into his house and found stacks of hadith that he never related. And people used to say to Malik, uh, you know, so-and-so relates that hadith, why don't you relate it? And he said, uh, you know, anybody that relates everything he knows is a fool. In other words, some things Imam Malik did not consider weighty enough for him to, uh, to teach. If you look at the Muatta, he spent 40 years honing the Muatta down, over 40 years. And there's about 1,700 hadith in there, 700 of which are actually not even uh, hadith, but rather sayings of the people of Medina. So Imam Malik was very influenced by the, the scholars of Medina who believed that the religion was about action, it wasn't about information. And that's why for him, far more important than amassing lots of hadith and knowing all these different opinions was the actual what do we practice? Because he really saw the deen as a practical matter. And he was not interested in those type of uh, hair splitting debates. He, he disdained asking about things that hadn't occurred. And when people would ask him about things that hadn't occurred, he would, he, he would ask them, has this occurred? And they would say no. And he said, well, then come back when it's happened and we'll talk about it. Or when people would uh, want to debate with him, he would say, go to Iraq. You know, just go and, because the, they like debate. But in Medina, they don't like debate. Um, he also s said that, uh, that argumentation is not from our religion. Argumentation is not our, from our religion. He would leave, if people started debating something, he would literally get up and leave. Um, he also, a man came to him once and said, uh, uh, I want to debate you. And he was from the Murjia. He was from a sect of Muslims. And Imam Malik knew that he was from that sect. And he said, what, what do you want to get out of the debate? He said, uh, well, if I, if I win the debate, you follow me. And Malik said, and if, and if I win the debate, he said, I'll follow you. And he said, what if a third person comes and debates us and, and, and he beats us? He said, then we follow him. He said, you're going to be on a new religion every day of your life. He said, what, what I know is what I know, and I'm not interested in debate. So Malik was really, he wasn't looking uh, for something new. He had inherited a school from the Tabi'een who took it from the Sahaba and he really felt that the corpus was there. It was just a matter of learning it and, and teaching it and transmitting it. That's, that's how he understood uh, his, um, his, uh, his school. And so uh, as, as the, one of the reasons why it spread so far and wide was because he was in Medina and he was known as Al-Alim al-Medina which is the the, the, the scholar of Medina, and there's a hadith in Tirmidhi, it's a sound hadith, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, uh, that there's coming a time soon when people would strike the, uh, you know, the sides of camels, يَضْرِبُونَ أَكْبَادَ الْإِبْرِي يَطْلُبُونَ الْعِلْمِ and they'll seek knowledge. And he said, فَلَنْ يَجِدُ أَعْلَمَ مِنْ عَالِمَ الْمَدِينَ They won't find anybody more knowledgeable than the scholar of Medina. And uh, the ulama of the time said we, we understood it to be Malik because there was nobody that got that, um, that laqab, you know, that nickname uh, other than Malik. And another thing that's very interesting about Malik, and it's one of my favorite stories about him, that he had a, um, a rival who was another muhaddith who Malik didn't really like very much and the other man didn't like Malik. It was kind of a mutual thing. But uh, he, uh, he said about, uh, when, when Imam Malik wrote the Muatta, um, and he called it the Muatta, which means the well-trodden path. You know, this, this is the way that many, many people have gone before. Um, when he wrote the Muatta, he put it out, and it had an amazing acceptance. Well, people started writing Muattas. And somebody came to him, and he said, Katharat al-Muatta'at. You know, there's a lot of Muattas now. Like you started this thing and now there's a whole bunch of muatas. 
And Imam Malik said, he didn't say anything other than, he said, What's for Allah will continue on and remain. And, and what is for other than Allah is severed and cut off. So, I mean, he was pretty much just leaving it to, you know, if I was sincere in this, Allah will give it tawfiq. And if, if I wasn't, then it won't get that tawfiq. So it doesn't matter what people do in the end, it's whether Allah accepts it or not. And that, and that was his view about it. So the muwatta uh, is, is not the basis of the madhab. It's, 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 uh, it definitely has a lot of the opinions. It has some opinions that are actually not Malik's opinions. Sometimes he points them out, other times he doesn't. Uh, for instance, people that argue for qabal argue that the qabal is in the muwatta. But in the mudawwana, which is the authoritative book of Malik's fiqh, it's, they don't have qabal, it has sadal. Um, so that's an example. But Imam Malik would use, uh, he, he put in the muwatta several hadith to show people that he knew the hadith. And that, uh, that he, 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 despite that, he wasn't using the hadith. So, uh, Another example is the Masalih, which Imam Malik focuses on Maslaha more than the other Imams. So he, is, he, he believes that the Sharia is essentially there to serve human beings and, and things that are beneficial to human beings that can rationally, rationally be discerned um, should be incorporated into uh, the law. And that's why um, uh, public welfare is so important in his madhab. Um, the what's called maslaha. He also uh, has because he has uh, an immense amount of wara, and uh, uh, Sha'rani says his imam is Omari. It's it's really following the madhab of Sayyidina Omar. He also has what's called sadda daraya, which is to cut off pretexts. Um, when he when he worries something will lead to something else, he might uh, have a legal ruling that in normal circumstances wouldn't contain that ruling. So an example of that is. Imam Malik considered it makru to fast the six days immediately after Ramadan, after the Eid. And the reason that he did is he said he, that he was afraid that people would actually uh, consider that part of Ramadan. So that's cutting off that pretext, sadda dharaya, that he does. Uh, istihsan, which is equity, is another aspect of his madhab, where sometimes... Um, he will prefer a position that follows the spirit of the law more than a position that follows the letter of the law because sometimes following the letter of the law can actually lead to an unjust ruling. And so when he sees that, he'll, he'll actually move towards uh, a ruling that, um, that is closer to the, to the maqasid or the spirit of the law. So um, the, uh, Ibn Asher basically gives us a, um, there was one story I wanted to. Yeah, another aspect of the Sadda Daraya is that uh, he prohibits the selling of weapons when there's civil strife. So it's actually haram to sell. Normally it's permissible to sell weapons. But when there's, when, when there's civil strife, when people are actually killing each other, he says it's haram because he's cutting off uh, the pretext of that. He also prohibits giving gifts to public officials. So you can't give a gift to somebody who's in a government position just as a, oh here, ha Merry Christmas or something. Um, because of the possibility for corruption and then that person feeling like they owe you a favor because that's the nature of gift giving is that people feel indebted to you. Um, and he has several other uh, examples uh, of that. Um, but Imam Malik of all the uh, of all the um, of all the Imams I think probably the, the distinguishing uh, factor in, in Malik is that he is uniquely from the Imams that have become canonical. He is uniquely the only one that is considered a master muhaddith and a master faqih. None of them have that status. Uh, Abu Hanifa was a muhaddith, but he was not uh, at the level of uh, Imam Malik.
He's, he's not, uh, even Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who was a muhaddith, um, his, 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 uh, his, his uh, musnad contains many, many weak hadiths, and he did not have the critical. Mm -hmm. Why isn't there a Hanbali class where? In the camp? Is there any Hanbalis? You're Hanbali? Mm. Well, you're definitely a minority. I mean, I don't, I know, you know, we can't, it's hard to serve. We, we don't have, there's very few Hanbalis uh, I mean, in the Muslim world, there's a handful of Hanbalis in Syria and, uh, and in Palestine. And then there's Hanbalis in Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait and a few in Qatar. And that, that's pretty much it. So the majority of, of Muslims that we serve are Hanafi, Shafi'i, and Maliki. We, we don't, you know, Ahmed ibn Hanbal is an Imam, but it's just there's not a lot of Hanbalis, so. I mean, I think you'd have to go maybe to Saudi Arabia or something and find a teacher. Because I don't know any Hanbali teachers in the U.S. And I, I know one student of the Hanbali Madhab uh, from the Americans. He lives in uh, the Emirates. Other than that, we don't, I mean, we don't have trained teachers that could even teach the Hanbali Madhab. Yeah. So. Yeah, Imam Ahmed was uh, a master of hadith. But his, his fiqh is not uh, at the level of Imam Malik. And the same is true for Imam Shafi'i, who was a faqih and a master of fiqh but his hadith is not. And, and this is what Qadha Iyad points out in Tartib al-Madarik, that Imam Madik uniquely had that uh, mastery of these two uh, fundamental sciences. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that's the way they look at it. They, like Imam Ahmed was muhaddith faqih, Imam Shafi is faqih muhaddith, Abu Hanif is faqih muhaddith, but Imam Malik goes both ways. Yeah, he goes both ways with equal dexterity. He's the only one that has that maqam. And that, that's agreed upon. You know, no, nobody debates that. Now the other thing about Imam Madik is that he, uh, he did not teach hadith in his fiqh class. So he actually didn't mention hadith in his fiqh class. If you go through the muatta, he doesn't mention uh, hadith. And that's very important because um, one of the things that people say about fiqh is like, where's your dalil? You know, the, this is a very modern kind of thing. What's your dalil? Fiqh was not taught with dalil. The dalil was the, the faqih that was teaching the fiqh. Like Imam Malik is the dalil. You don't know hadith without Imam Malik. And to learn hadith and fiqh, you have to study usul. You can't, because it's not simply here's your dalil. Sometimes the dalil is very subtle. It's, it's not, uh, uh, sometimes the delil relates to the fact, like for instance, Abu Huraira is a muhaddith, but he's not a faqih. Abu Huraira rarely gave fatwa. He did give fatwa, but rarely. So uh, when, when Abu Huraira has a hadith that has fiqh in it, the, the imams will not necessarily take that hadith. For instance, Abu Huraira used to do his wudu up into his arm. Because the Prophet ﷺ said to Yazidu fi ghurratihi. You know, like if you that that on Yom Qiyamah the people of wudu are known they're ghur muhajjalun. They come with white arms and white faces and white feet. So the Prophet knows them through that. So the Prophet ﷺ said about doing the hadith that to increase in your ghurra. So Abu Huraira understood that to mean to go beyond the elbow. None of the other Sahaba understood that. So the Imam Malik said that's not what it means. It means to do wudu on top of wudu. It doesn't mean to go, because the sunnah is to go up to the elbow. 
There's no hadith that indicate the Prophet. So there's an example of a Sahabi who understood something, but the, his fiqh of that hadith, and Aisha corrected Abu Hurairah in several instances, in fiqh. Like she, she said, he misunderstood the hadith. So Abu Hurairah was a transmitter of hadith and not necessarily a faqih. The way that they, the ulama uh, understand this is that they say the, the, the muhaddith is like the pharmacist and the faqih is the doctor. The pharmacist gives the, the, uh, the medicine, but it's the faqih that prescribes it. And so the muhaddith is not really somebody who's necessarily uh, understands uh, the fiqh of what he's teaching. So now uh, we're going to go to the, uh, that chapter on, it's called Muqaddimatun min al-usuli mu'inatun fi furu'iha ala al this is a, uh, an introduction to the usul of, uh, which is very basic, but it's important for uh, fiqh. And the first thing that he says uh, is that the, the, the khitab, al-hukmu fi shari khitabu rabbina. Al-hukmu, the hukum is a legal ruling in sharia. And the legal ruling is khitabu rabbina. It's a statement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and muqtadi fi'lan mukallif iftuna that has to be acted upon by anyone legally responsible. So if you are legally responsible, the mukallif is somebody who reaches uh, puberty. Puberty is known by the signs of puberty. Uh, the underarm hair, the, uh, uh, the body odor changing, uh, breast development, um, the the uh, the uh, the hail for menstruation for the girls, um, and then the many, which is seminal uh, fluid, and then uh, a change also in the uh, the throat. You know where where they get the Adam's apple. Um, so the, these these are the signs. But in the Maliki fiqh, there's a khilaf. Is it 15 or 18? If you don't get any of those signs, Ibn Asher. Uh, says that it's 18. So a person, uh, if they don't have any signs of puberty at the age of 18, whether they have them or not, they begin uh, uh, a mukallaf. So they have a taklif statement. So the, the taklif is, is uh, your legal responsibility to fulfill whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has joined in you. So it has forms that are five, a command, an authorization, a stipulation. So the talab is where you're commanded to do something. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you have to, uh, you know, kutiba uh, alaykum uh, al-siyam, you know, fasting is prescribed upon you. So that, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given uh, a talab. And then an authorization, the idhan, uh, comes with the, the permissibility to do something. Because sometimes things are not permissible uh, and other times uh, they are. So uh, the, the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many, many things are mubah. Allah says, you know, kulu wa shrabu, eat and drink, but not to excess. Or be wadai. So a stipulation has uh, either sabab, uh, uh, shart or a prohibition. So, for instance, uh, the suburb would be when 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 uh, when the sun reaches the the zenith, right uh, at the, uh, the 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 zenith, ninety degrees. At the point it reaches one degree away from that ninety degrees. So, at the ninety-first degree in the heaven, which is four minutes technically after uh, zawal. At that point, that is a sabab for the obligation of dhuhr. That's called a sabab. It's a sabab for the obligation of dhuhr. Before that, there's a, ma a mana. So there's a mana. So sabab and mana are related. So before that, you cannot pray dhuhr. There's a mana. And so Allah put that as a sign. And also a condition of dhuhr is that it enters in the time. That's a condition or that you're in wudu, that's a condition, it's a shart, shartu sahati saratikum, so it's a condition of the validity of your prayer, is that you're in wudu, or if you had janaba, that you remove the janaba through ghusl, if there's no water, you did it uh, temporarily through uh, tayammum, 
So the, these are uh, the ways in which uh, the, the hukum of Allah becomes applicable through tarab, idhan, and then the wada of sabab, shart, or mana, a preventative. Does everybody understand that? Any question about that? Okay. Uh huh. No, that's when it becomes uh, obligatory. That's a sabab. But it goes all the way to, in the Maliki Madhab, to right before the uh, Asr. All right. You can pray any time during that period. No, no, no. That's just the beginning. Yeah, that's the beginning. The sabab for the obligation of dhuhr is a one degree movement away from the kabad as sama. Then it's a manner. Then, then the, you cannot pray. It's haram to pray it. Yeah. Uh huh. I'm going to do that when we get to the uh, the prayer times because Malik's prayer times are the most lenient of all the madhabs and uh, the, he's uh, uh, it's one of the areas where he's very very generous so and then he says aqsamu hukm ash-shar'i khamsatun turam fardun wa nadmun wa karahatun haram so the uh, the categories of legal rulings in the sharia are five there are five categories Fard, which is also called wajib. In the Hanafi madhab, uh, Abu Hanifa distinguishes between fard and wajib. Wajib is more like sunnah mu'akkada in the Hanafi madhab. So for instance, Abu Hanifa says it's wajib for a man to wear the hat in the prayer, which is why you always see Hanafis, even they'll put a handkerchief on their head. But he doesn't mean fard. This is, these are technical terms. But in the Maliki madhab, fard and wajib are synonymous. So the uh, the nedbun is mandub, all right, which is also called uh, sunnah by you know most Muslims call like the prayers that you pray before dhuhr and after dhuhr. Most Muslims call those sunnah, but they're actually called nafila, right? Because there's a there the the the, the Malikis distinguish between a sunnah uh, and a nafila. And then they have Sunnah Mu'akkada and Nafida Mu'akkada. So those are called Nafida Mu'akkada. But in the, in the language of common people, they're, they're just called Sunnah. Hmm? The Rawatib, yeah. Hmm. So, and then you have Karaha, which is discouraged. Makru. Something is Makru. Uh, well, let, 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 I'll, I'll explain all five in a, in a second how, how they relate. And then finally, haram, which is a prohibition. Now, the way to understand these the best is this. Fard is that if you do it, you're rewarded. If you leave it, you're, uh, you're punished. I mean, maybe or maybe not, but there's a punishment that entails leaving it. Mandub, you're rewarded if you do it. You're not punished if you, if you leave it. Mubah, neither nor. Right? The, the Mubah is, is neither nor. Because he says, Thumma ibaha is the next one. Neither nor. And then the, uh, the Karaha, you're rewarded if you leave it, but you're not punished if you do it. And then the Haram, you're punished if you do it, and uh, you're also rewarded if you leave it um, with the Niyyah, if it's something. Mm -hmm. No. No no mandub is associated with a punishment. It's extra. I mean the reason mandub is important and nafida and sunan is is because they they act as a um they redress the shortcomings of your fard. So the first thing you say after you finish your fard prayer, what's the first thing that you say in the sunnah? Astaghfirullah. And the reason you say Astaghfirullah is because your prayer is never what it should be. So the shortcoming of the prayer is something that is redressed by the extra acts that you do. Abu uh, Imam al-Nawawi likens it to the prayer is a gift, but the sunnah is the wrapping that you wrap it in to bring it to the king. And even though the wrapping is extraneous, 
people always like gifts wrapped. You know, it's, it's a, it shows that there was more love in the gift than just giving the gift. So he likens it to that, that the, uh, the, the extra acts are ways of embellishing uh, what you have to do. And then he says, فَمَأْمُورٌ juzim, A command given resolutely is fard. So in the Qur'an, when Allah uses a command, for instance, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, that uh, if there's a, what's called fi'l amr in the Qur'an, it almost always means because of an obligation. You know, qatilu fi sabirillahi. You know, struggle in the way of Allah. Qatilu. It doesn't say min al tayyib law tu qatiluna or in tu qatiluna. You know, it would be good if you struggled. It doesn't say that. It says qatilu fi sabirillah. Alladini yalunukum min al kufar, for instance. Or it says aqimu salah. You know, establish the prayer. It doesn't say. Uh, you know, it would be good if you established the prayer. No, aqimu salat. So when that's resoluteness, that's called jazm. So when the hukam is jazm, it's considered fard. Now there are times when the, the, for instance, the Prophet said, "Kuntu an hakum an ziyarat al qubur fazuruha." I, I, I used to tell you don't visit graves because he was worried about the jahili practices once the deen was strong and he wasn't worried about the, the shirk that uh, was involved in things like that. He told people, visit the graves. And he used a, an imperative mode, command, tarab. Um, he th but that's not an obligation. You see, it's not, it's not an obligation. The Quran says, kulu wa sharabu, eat and drink but not to excess. That, I mean, obviously you have to eat and drink uh, to stay alive. But eating and drink, the command to eat and drink doesn't mean you know, that it's, it's imperative at, at uh, all times to eat and drink or whatever. So it has to be understood within the context. But when it is resolute like that, then it's considered fard. And then dun al-jazmi mandub. When it's other than jazm, it's mandub. So it's either sunnah or nafila. Uh, depending on that. And do nahi makruhun wa ma'hatman haram. If if there's a prescription, if it's if you're told not to do it, it's for it's for karahiya unless there's a, a proof that it's for tahrim. Because tahrim is the hardest thing to establish in usul. That something is haram is the most difficult thing to establish. Uh, to say something is haram, you have to have a strong proof. Uh, because the dominant opinion is things are halal unless there's a proof that they're haram. Uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything uh, in, the, in the heavens and the earth for humans. So, and then he says, uh, uh, An authorization of either or is merely permitted. So when, when it's, it's, you know, Allah says, Kulu wa shrabu, Eat and drink. That means everything is halal to eat and drink unless there's a qaid. So in usul you have generalizations, umum and khusus. You have itlaq and taqyid. So you have something that is absolute and then you have something that's restricted. So when Allah says eat and drink, that's, that's atlaqu. He atlaqu he, al-hukum. He, 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 uh, he, he, he made it absolute, it's unrestrained. But then there are things in the Qur'an that tell you what not to eat. And there's things in the Sunnah that tell you what not to eat. And because of that, the, 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 those become uh, exceptions from the general rule that everything is halal to eat or drink, except for wine, right? Because al-khamrishnu min amr shaytan It's an evil. فَلَأَنْتُمْ muntahun, You know, you, are you going to leave it like I've told you to leave it? So that's an example of uh, and then he says والفرد قسمان كفاية وعين ويشمل المندوب سنة بذين the obligations are of two types collective and individual a fard عين is يتعين على كل مسلم مكلف it, it is an obligation upon every adult Muslim, male or female, unless there's a proof otherwise. 
like jihad is not an obligation on the women unless a city is attacked directly. Uh, because the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah didn't, so he said the jihad of women was hajj. The, the fard is, is kifaya, and the fard kifaya goes under the bab of jihad in books of fiqh. That's when they talk about fard kifaya, because jihad itself is a fard kifaya, uh, which is to defend the lands of the Muslims. Unless, obviously, they're un, uh, incomplete, if, if they're being attacked, uh, then, and, 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 it's not enough for a group of people to do it. It becomes incumbent on even the women at a certain point. So the kifaya are things like engineering is a fard kifaya, medicine is a fard kifaya, all the things that help a society uh, flourish and human culture to flourish are actually cons fall under that category. Um, and and uh, the fard ayn are those things that Allah has made and coming on everybody. The, the fard ayn are s six basic categories, but the most important thing is learning uh, the, what you have to do to fulfill your religion. And, and uh, that's why prayer and fasting is fard ayn on everybody who's an adult who prays and fasts. You have to know the basic rules of praying and fasting. A lot of Muslims don't know these rules, so they're considered athim. It's it, they're in a state of sinfulness until they learn the rules of praying. Um, and then also the t same is true for fasting, because there are rules that go with fasting that if you don't learn them, your fasting is incomplete. And uh, the same is true for zakat and for hajj. Um, and then w it's also a fard ayn to learn anything that you go into. Like if you're going to get married, you're supposed to learn the rules of hayd, for instance, a, a man it's hayl is not just for women. A man is supposed to learn the rules of hayl too because they apply to him in, in marriage. Otherwise, they don't apply to him. If you, if you uh, are going to enter into commerce, then you have to learn the rules of buying and selling because there are rules that are related to that. I mean, he says earlier, uh, he says in the, in the, uh, in the Bab of Tasawwuf, he said, He does not do anything until he knows the, ruling, the legal ruling in that thing. So it's actually incumbent upon Muslims to know what the legal ruling of something is. To know what the legal ruling of... I mean, a lot of people, ahkam al-lisan are amazing, the rules of the tongue. Uh, the tuhfat al-burur, which you're studying, the book on the rules of uh, parents, is very important to know, like what you owe to your parents. Because your parents have uh, immense rights uh, over you, and those rights have been codified uh, in the sharia. So the, the kifaya and the ayn are very important. The basic rule is the, 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 the ayn needs a proof that it's a fard ayn. The Prophet ﷺ said in Ibn Majah, a famous hadith, طَرَبُ عِلْمًا فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمًا And then the idraj of the hadith, which is something was added by the ruwat wa muslima, just to emphasize, even though it was understood man and woman, but that was added to emphasize that. And that's why the hadith is related with men and women. The learning is an obligation on every male and female. You have to learn. And so seeking knowledge is incumbent. It's a fard ayn to seek knowledge. Even the ulama say it's permissible to disobey your parents uh, in seeking fard ayn knowledge. If they say, no, you can't go uh, study and, and you don't have that knowledge, it's permissible to, to disobey them in that. That's how important it is. So that is a basic, he's giving you a really basic primer on, uh, on understanding also. But the beauty of this is every single thing in the world goes under one of those five categories. And you can add to that, uh, uh, you know, salihun wa batinun or fasid and salih, you know, which is like certain marriage contracts are, are invalid. And, and so those are the two that are added on to those five things. So anything that you can think of, what's the legal ruling of, um, you know, using paper cups, is definitely makru, I would say. Because, you know, it leads to israf. It's a type of extravagance. And anything that's extravagant is, so everything has a legal ruling. What's the legal ruling of using a microphone uh, in a masjid? The ulama permit it because you can raise your voice in a masjid, even though it's makru to raise your voice in a masjid. Uh, 
and uh, if it if it does tashwish, it can be reach the level of prohibition. But to teach using a microphone is permissible uh, in the masjid uh, if it's not during times when, when uh, the prayer is is going. So those are examples. Everything has legal rulings. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if it's if it's you know, the, you can ask doctors what levels of decibels are, and if it's going to hurt the ears, then it enters into the haram. So, and unfortunately, there are places where the decibels are too high. That's true, but I mean, you can if it if it's harmful, generally it's either makru or haram, depending on the the degree of harmfulness. Do you know? But but any la darara wa la dirar. There is no harm and there's no reciprocating harm. That's a qaida in, in, in qawaid al fiqhiya. That's, that's a strong qaida. There is no harming and there's no reciprocating harm. So anything that yudurruna is something the sharia ah does not encourage. Unless it's in the very thing itself, you know, like sometimes there are things that you have to do that the, the, the harm the benefit that's derived from the thing is greater than the harm incurred. And, and these are, a lot of it's common sense. I mean, a great deal of usul is really common sense. Which is why it's a great gift to have common sense. Uh, it's very uncommon. Yeah. I mean, common sense is the idea of, of your, your, your five senses working together. You know, so that you're kind of in a harmony. That was the common sense was like the it was it, it was it was everything working together because these are all inroads for knowledge. Your eyes, you see, you hear, touch, taste. Like you smell something, and it doesn't smell good. Common sense says don't eat it, which is why uh, the mustaqdarat, like in the in the Shafi'i madhab, things that the self naturally is repulsed by, he considers prohibited because it's common sense. If something smells bad, now obviously there's taste involved. I mean, a lot of French cheeses smell horrible, but people eat them anyway, right? So there's orf that goes under those categories, and that's why Imam Malik says these things are orf issues because some people <laughs> consider certain things disgusting, and other people like them. So, but there there is uh, definitely a common sense element here. Um, the next section, is there any questions on that section? Mm -hmm. When I talked about what? Uh -huh. Well, there's things that the Prophet did, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that are makru to do, but he did them to show that they weren't haram. No, not in a sigat al-amr. Yeah. Unless it's in a negation. لا تفعلوا. Normally, لا تفعلوا, if it's an amr, it's for the tahrim, but not always. Do you see what I mean? So the amr can be for makru, but it's with the negation. Aha, <laughs> fa'idu, yeah. Oh, that's a good, yeah, no, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting example. That Ata, radiallahu anhu, considered it makru. But he derived it not from the Amr. Yeah, that, that's a good example. Um, Ata, radiallahu anhu, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi in Ahkam al-Quran says about that, that Ata, from min diqqati fiqhihi, astakhraja karahiyat al-dharb. And, but he took it from a hadith, which is, لا تضربوا إما الله You know, don't strike the maidservants of Allah. And in another one, he said, أكره أن يضرب أحدكم أهله ثم يضاجعها في آخر النهار it, It's distasteful to me that one of you should strike a maidservant and then sleep with her at the end of the day. In other words, there's an incompatibility with intimacy, love and intimacy, and with violence. I mean, that's pretty much what the Prophet ﷺ was saying. So Atta understood that even though it says, وَضْرِبُهُنَّ uh, 
to, 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 to strike them. It's really tap them because darb can be a tap. Like in, in tayammum, they call it darbat al-ula wa thaniya, and it's a tap. So darb doesn't just mean hit. It can mean tap in Arabic. And, and it's closer to, you know, it's, it's, it's like a... It's like a slap on the, you know. I mean, you see it in, 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 in films and things, yeah. You know, you see those films where the woman's hysterical and the man, like, slaps her and suddenly she's, like, normal. It's, it's that, that is basically, that's the extent of what was possible. But the idea of violence being associated with that is totally haram. Nobody's ever in the history of Islam said that domestic violence was an acceptable nobody in the history of Islam. I don't know any Adam who's ever said that you can beat a woman, beat her. Nobody. All of them, even Ibn Abbas, I mean, if you look, you know, his thing about the miswak is a clear indication that they all had problems with the verse. You know, it's like, this can't mean, because the purpose of a home is sakina, litaskunu ilayha. Uh, the purpose of marriage is that you protect a woman. So if you become the, the, the source of her fear, something's gone deeply wrong. Yeah. Yeah, if they use that on Darby Mrati, that's true. But if you look, that hadith, which is in Aridat al Ahwadi, Qadi Abu Bakr's. Uh, commentary of Tirmidhi. If you look at his commentary on that, no, sorry. If you look at the Al-Aun Al-Ma'bud, which is Ibn Qayyim al jawziya he says the meaning of that is لا يسأر عن ضرب امرأته A man's not asked about hitting his wife. After it's happened, if people hear about it, because it would lead to backbiting against her. So it's to protect the woman. So, because if you ask, why'd you hit her? And you say, oh, because she did this, that, or the other. He's exposing her faults. That's what it meant. You know, the, the people misunderstand this religion. I mean, that's why you need ulama. I mean, if you don't have ulama. Mm -hmm. uh, a story of what? The hijab? Oh, Ayub, Job, yeah, Job. Uh huh. So he hits her with the the twig. Yeah, yeah. He took a hundred and bound them together, and they were grass. It was grass just to get out of the nether. Yeah. It was grass, which is very soft. Yeah. No, no, it's very clear. I mean, I, I, it's, it's just outrageous that, that any Muslims could argue uh, domestic violence. It's outrageous. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's, it's really, it's very troubling. The Prophet never hit a woman or a child or a servant ever. Lam yadrib Rasulullah imra'atan wara waradan wara ghulaman qat. Qat. I mean, it's emphasized. Ever. He never hit. And wara qad kana lakum fi Rasulullah iswatun hasana. You know, you have in him the best example. I mean, he's the best example. And he said, Lam yadriba khiyarukum. The best amongst you would never strike a woman. I mean, he said that, that it's something low. He said, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَمْلَكَ لِذِي لُبٍ مِنْ كُنَّ I haven't seen any creatures more possessive of a man of intellect than you women. أَمْلَكَ مِنْ كُنَّ لِذِي لُبٍ Somebody who has intellect. If you do, and, 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 and so somebody that doesn't have intellect is like a, a beast. They control women. But people that are sensitive, people that have intellect, tend to be controlled by women. You know, that, that's, that's more their nature, is, is to submit to the... Uh... And that's the way the Prophet Sallallahu was. That he, irda'u nisa'ihi, he was very important to him, to make sure that they were happy. So anyway, we come to the Book of Purity now, Kitab al-Tahara. 
Tahara in the Arabic language it relates to nalafa, cleanliness. And uh, but the Tahara is a what they call sifa hukmiya, yustabahu biha ma yumnau min al hadithi wal khabat. It's a, a quality, a legal state that you're in that permits you to do what would normally be prohibited because of hadith or khabat. Hadith are those ahdath, uh, are the uh, occurrences uh, that happen biologically um, uh, from, you know, like urine, feces, wind, um, those things that uh, put you uh, in a state in which you lose your wudu or ghusl. And then the khabath are impurities. So you have uh, some feces on your on your robe or something. Tahara removes that. So now water. So that this is this is basically the reason the books of fiqh begin before wudu about tahara is because you need to know uh, how what water is is uh, you know what's called tahir and what tahor. There's two types of water uh, in terms of purity. Tahir is water that is tahirun, it's pure, and you can use it for adat. Tahurun is water that's pure that you can use for adat and ibadat. Adat are like uh, everyday things. So if water, if you put rose water into water, it's tahirun, but it's not tahur. It's, it doesn't purify other things. So you can't use it to remove uh, uh, najasa, and you can't use it to do wudu or something like that. Because it doesn't have that purifying element that the water does normally. So if you, uh, he, so he says here, فَصْنُ وَتَحْصُرُ الطَّهَرَةُ بِمَا مِنَ التَّغَيُّرُ بِشَيْءٍ سَرِمَا إِذَا تَغَيَّرَ بِنَجْسٍ طُرِحَا أَوْ طَاهِرٍ لِعَادِثٍ قَدْ صَلُحَا إِلَّا إِذَا لَازَمُهُ فِي الْغَالِبِ كَمُغْرَةٍ فَمُنْطَقٌ كَذَائِبِ So he says uh, that ritual purification is obtained through the use of pure water that is free of any alteration by something that changes its taste, smell, or color. So water should not smell if it's good, if it's pure water. It shouldn't have a taste. Water's a, I mean, it doesn't have a taste like other things have a taste. Obviously, the water, you know, you can taste water, but it doesn't have, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just water. I mean, it, it doesn't have that taste that other things have. And then that it doesn't have a smell. So if it has any of those three, one or more of those three things, it loses its tahuriya. If, if it's impure because of an impurity, then it, it loses its, uh, its tahiriya. It's not tahir. So the tahuriya is the ability for it to remove impurities uh, of, of hadith or khabat. And then the, the tahiriya is, is uh, the, that you don't use it for uh, even adat. You don't drink it or put it in food or cook with it or something like that. Unless, uh, he, so he says, if it's, if it's uh, safe from impurity, nejis, and we're going to do nejis in a second. If it's safe from impurity, uh, if, it, if it changes because of impurity, then it's discarded. But if it's changed by a pure substance, then you can use it for conventional daily, non-devotional uses. Unless it's something that becomes an intrinsic property, like rust. Like if it has rust color, do you know, then it's still tahur. Uh, or, for instance, if it has a smell like arsenic or uh, sulfur, like certain, you know, if, if you're in a place where the water is sulfuric, then that's something you lazimuhu fil ghalib. It's always with it. So that's considered. And now, I mean, chlorine is part of, uh, you know, it, it's just part, yeah, it's you lazimuhu fil ghalib. And it's done for maslaha, to, to protect people. So the, this, the, if it has a chlorinated smell, I mean, I would not use like pool water to do wudu if, if it's got chlorine in it, you know, because, because, um, there's no necessity to do that if you have other water to do it. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, what I would do is I would wash with it, and I wouldn't I wouldn't use it in your mouth because the mouth is only a sunnah. Yeah, I would do that before I would use I, I, I you know iodine in the water. Mm -hmm. Well, for instance, no, you find places where water has uh, rust in it because of where it's flowing from. You see what I mean? So they're, 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 they're uh, for instance, because of pipes, you get that redness. That, that's still pure water. This is about water. Yeah. I mean, water... You know, water is the foundation of our religion. Without water, I mean, everything's based on water. Our life is based on water. Our prayer is based on water. Um, so water is very important. You know, water is going to become increasingly important too because the water tables are all dropping. And, you know, the wars of the 21st century are probably going to be water wars. Water conservation is part of our religion also. The Prophet ﷺ said, that it was, you know, he said it was fisk to waste water even on, 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 in a river. Like, because people could say, if he said that, they say, oh, well, he was living in the desert and, you know, but he said, ala jari. you know, even if you were on a flowing river, to waste water is israf, you know, it's fisk. <laughs> ala jari. That's what he said. I mean, that's so clear that it's about conservation. It's not about, uh, you know, desert. And, and we waste a lot of water. I mean, the average person uses six liters to do wudu. And you can easily do wudu with half a liter, easily. Mm -hmm. It's probably, yeah, maybe a little less. Yeah, it was a uh, half a liter, yeah, around there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, water is pure. That's, it's pure and purifying in, by its essential nature. It's only things that come into it that change its state. But the basis of water is pure. Just like kullu nashif in tahir, that's a qaida. Any dry thing is assumed to be pure before you consider it to have impurities. So if you're in a house and there's babies that, uh, are urinating and defecating, then you know you have cause to believe that the carpet, even though it's dry, might have impurities on it. But if you go into a house, there's no children, there's no you know there's no dogs or anything. Then the assumption is that that it's pure. So you you assume purity before you assume impurity. You assume permissibility before you assume impermissibility. That that that's an assumption in fiqh. Things are pure before they're impure. Things are halal before they're haram. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yeah, ocean water is tahir. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, a man came to him ﷺ and said, Arkab al-bahar wa li qalinun min al-ma fa You know, I get thirsty. <laughs> if I did wudu, then, you know, the, the water would go. And he said, uh, ma'u al-bahari you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the water of the ocean is, is pure and purifying and the, the dead of the ocean is halal to eat. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's one of the three. That's why he, obviously, the salt taste. And as far as we know, the Prophet ﷺ did not go to the ocean. He saw the ocean because Allah showed him the ocean in the cave at Ghar Thawr. Allah opened it up and showed him um, the ocean. There was a boat to take him if they needed it. But he, uh, he, he, didn't, he never visited the ocean. He learned to swim, though, in a birka in Medina when he was a little boy. He was visiting his um, his uh, akhwal, you know, his maternal side of the family. And he learned to swim in a little... It used to be there. Unfortunately, they recently destroyed it. Mm-hmm.
What's that? When he was in the cave with Abu Bakr, he looked to the other end of the cave and there was an opening and the ocean was there and there was a boat. When they, when, when they were afraid that, you know, the Prophet wasn't afraid, but Abu Bakr was terrified. Yeah, on the Hijra at Ghar Thawr. So he looked and, and Allah showed him the ocean. And in other words, he had an escape if, if he needed it. Just gave him tranquility. He took the coastal route, but if you look at Sheikh Abdullah al-Qadi's, he didn't go to the coast. It, it's a coastal route, but he did not go anywhere near, you know, the, the ocean. I mean, he might have seen it, I don't know, you know, but as far as we know, he definitely didn't travel on it. And the Sahaba discouraged uh, ocean travel until Muawiyah. Muawiyah convinced Omar ibn al-Khattab to start a navy. But uh, before that, Omar didn't want to do it. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, the biggest proof that Allah is latif, latifun bi'ibadihi, is um, sailors. Because he said they're the worst people. And they, and they, he said, afsaqu khalqillah. You know, they're like the most corrupt type of people, sailors. And, and he said, and yet, they travel on, on uh, little sticks across vast oceans and Allah causes them to arrive safely. <laughs> When, when uh, Sayyidina Umar asked Amr ibn al-As what boats were like, he said they're like little sticks and the people are like little ants on them. He said, I wouldn't want to force any Muslims to do that. <laughs> so, the um, just to go on what is Tahir, because this is important in relation to uh, what makes things impurity. Tahir is every living thing is considered Tahir according to Imam Malik. Araquhu wa damuhu wa mukhatuhu wa lu'abuhu. It's sweat, it's, it's blood, unless it comes out. You know, the masfuh, once it leaves the... Um, it's... Uh, and then it's, uh, it's uh, mucus, like the phlegm. And it's uh, saliva. That's all pure, including dogs and pigs according to Imam Malik. And Imam Malik said there's no proof to say that pigs or dogs are impure. Their meat, the meat of the pig is nejis, you know, to eat it. But the, the pig itself is pure, it doesn't lay you nejis. And he said about the dog, Imam Malik knew the hadith, إِذَا وَلَغَ كَلْبٌ فِي إِنَاءٍ فَاغْسِلُهُ سَبْعًا You know, if, 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 if a dog licks in a bowl, that's what it says, a bowl. It doesn't say if it licks you. It says if it licks in a bowl, wash it seven times. Now Imam Malik said, if it was for najasa, there's no need to say seven times. Because najasa, you just remove it, however much it takes you. It might take more than seven times if it's something that's hard to get off. So he said the fact that he said seven times means there's some other meaning to it. It's ta'abudi. He called that ta'abudi. You know, there, there's ma'qul al-nas, and then there's the, the nas that is ta'abudi. Ma'qul al-nas means it's rational. Ta'abudi means it's rational, but we don't know the reason. You know, akhfa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illatuhu anna. Like he hid its, uh, you know, legal ration, rationale from us. So we don't know why there's three rakats at uh, Maghrib or two at Fajr. It's ta'abudi. There's a reason, but we don't know why. Mm -hmm. Well, that's different. See, if, 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 they, if they roll around in their feces, it's the feces that's nejis. It's not the pig. Do you see? So if a, if, if, if a cat comes up to you with feces on it, the feces is nejis. You have to avoid the feces, but the cat itself is not nejis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The hunting. Yeah, exactly. That, the other proof that the Malikis use is that the Quran states that you can eat what your dogs hunt. 
And, uh, and if, if, if something that is nedges bites into meat or something, the meat becomes impure. So Imam Madik said it can't be nedges because the meat's not impure. There's nothing, even in the Hanafi Madhab, they don't break your wudu. Yeah. I mean, dogs are unjustly treated to me by the Muslims. I'm serious. I really believe that. Dogs have been really given a bad rap by the Muslims. Dogs are nice animals. There's a book by a Yemeni scholar, Fadru al-Kilab ala kathira mimman labis al-thiyab. The superiority of dogs over most who wear clothes. Yeah. That, that it has, uh, and no, I don't think it's, I don't think it's him, but, but, uh, you know, he just, uh, and Hassan al-Basri has ten qualities that are in dogs that should be in every seeker of God. Hassan al-Basri. Like he said, they get up at night and like they howl at the moon. He said, seekers should get up at night and call on God. He said that they, they won't eat without looking around. Dogs. They always look around before they eat. He said they're always grateful. If you do something for a dog, it's always grateful. Like if you feed it, it's like gets really happy. He said that they, they're always loyal. They never turn on their masters. Um, they protect the weak like dogs. And there are many stories in this culture of dogs that uh, save children and you know, they have Ghayra dogs. I mean, there's a dog, there's an amazing, I, I read this story about a lady who was attacked by a bear and her dog ran like 10 miles or something to this place and just was barking so intensely to the people that they, they knew something was wrong and he was like, trying to get them to come and they followed him to the and found this lady and saved her life because of that many stories like that of dogs that I mean I read that in the in the newspaper you know which doesn't mean it's true but <laughs> but there are many many examples so dogs are dogs are given a bad rap I think by Muslims in my own teacher Marab al Hajj wallahi I used to eat dinner with him at night and he, and he would take the couscous, put it in his left hand, and he fed the dog while we were eating dinner. Wallahi. Saw it with my own eyes. Because Bedouin have dogs. You know, Bedouin actually like dogs. And Ibn Abi Zayl al-Qayrawani, the great Maliki scholar, had a dog for Hirasa. Because it's permissible to take dogs for Hirasa. He had a dog for Hirasa, and somebody asked him about it. He said, Wallahi, if Malik was alive, Today he would take a lion, you know, because there was so much crime or something. <laughs> anyway, a dog, you shouldn't have a dog in the house. But we know that the, the Prophet, there was a puppy dog in the house. Aisha had a puppy dog. And that, that's why when Jibreel didn't come for three days, it was because the, the puppy was in the house. So there were dogs, this idea that the Prophet hated dogs or something. And there's a hadith about the black dog, the Aqur. But that has to do with wild dogs. They were feral dogs that were in Mecca that used to come down from the hills. And they had, they had rabies. So the Prophet said, told them to kill them if they come down. But Muslims think it's like every dog. No, they were wild dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you shouldn't in the backyard, in the yard. Yeah, dogs are good animals. And I, I think Muslims should have pets anyway. I'm not encouraging you to get a dog because other Muslims, I mean, I, I would actually, you know, like to have a dog for my kids because dogs are very protective of little children in particular. I mean, they will attack anybody that tries to mess with, you know, a child. But, you know, Muslims, I mean, it's like poor uh, Khadid Abu Fadl had a dog and, you know, People made a big deal about it. No, I mean, you have certain dogs are vicious. I mean, there are certain dogs that are very violent. Most dogs would never do that. They're like cats. I mean, cats know intuitively not to scratch babies. You know, cat, they, they do. They're, that's why they're alif, they're domesticated. Domesticated animals, that's their secret, is they don't attack us. That's why they're domesticated. But there are certain dogs 
that are verging on wild dogs, like pit bulls. Pit bulls will, will eat babies. You know, they'll attack people and kill people. Yeah, they are pit bulls. No, but I mean, pit bull is, that's absolutely haram to have a pit bull. Because it's, it's worse than a gun. They, they, they have a potential to really cause harm on others as well. They're, they're more wild than they are domesticated pit bulls. And the people that have them are usually kind of criminal mentality. Do you know? They are. They're, 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 it's a low life type of mentality that wants a pit bull. You know, most people like dogs because they're, they're companions. They're, they're happy. They're nice. They're, pit bulls are like, I mean, they're, you know, it says something about the owner more than the dog. Well, if it's dead, yeah, if it's dead. And then there's a khilaf about certain animals. Well, Malik is, he, yeah, he, Malik limits the prohibition of, I mean, Malik permits do, eating dogs. There's karahiya. There's karahiya, you know. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, Koreans, you know, they need a medhab. Because <laughs> that's like a delicacy in Korea. You know, all, when the Koreans came to Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah, all the dogs disappeared. And there was a Korean in L.A. who ate their next-door neighbor's dog. It was a, it was a big case in L.A. They, sued, the, they tried to sue him. and I mean, He was like, you know, it was a nice-looking dog. He got hungry. <laughs> Uh, I once, you know, I had a one of my teachers, he was Mauritanian, Sheikh Muhammad Shaybani, and there was another one, Sheikh Sidiya. And, and, and Shaybani was, he kind of inclined towards the prohibition of dog. Because there's an opinion in the Maliki Method that it's prohibited to eat Muharram. But he inclined towards that opinion. And uh, Sheikh Sidiya, who's a Mauritanian, very real Bedouin, but he was a Mufti in the Emirates, but very Bedouin. And he was like, you know, most of the Mauritanians, like the idea that you could challenge Malik is just absolutely absurd. So they would get upset, even if you'd think that you could disagree with him. So he kind of said, how do we that? How can you say? He said, Imam Malik said it was makru, and you should just leave it at that. And he said, uh, and Sheikh Shebani said, nah. he said, the, you know, it's... And so they were debating about it. And then I mentioned that about the Asians, that certain Asians, you know, eat dogs. And when I said that, the Sheikh Sidiya, who was arguing for the dog, he said, He said, they eat dogs. I said, yeah, they eat dogs. He said, And Sheikh Shema just looked at me and said, see, you know, you're disgusted by us. <laughs> And then he says, um, also the egg is pure. Illa al-madir, unless it becomes uh, foul. You know, like a rotten egg is considered najis. Wa ma kharaja ba'da mawtihi. And if it comes out after the animal dies, then it has the category of najis. Balgham, which is phlegm, is considered um, pure. Safra, which is bile, is considered pure. So the contents of the stomach are pure unless they've been changed. al mutagayyar All right, so qalas, which is like reflux, you know, gastric reflux, is pure. And, uh, and bile is pure. It's something that's released by the gallbladder. And, uh, but if you, what you vomit is changed, food, and has a smell, it's considered impure. And then maytul uh, adami, you know, the, the dead things from uh, humans, ma la damalahu is pure. Wal uh, bahri, also things from the ocean, wa ma dhukkiya min ghayri muharram al akli. And also what was sacrificed, if it's not haram to eat, then it's considered pure. If it's dhukkiya, if it had been sacrificed. And then there's a khilaf about the use of animals if you, it goes through a tanning process. So, even it, like here, belts and things like that. I mean, if you went staunch Maliki Madhab, you really shouldn't wear belts that you don't know where they came from. But that's, there's a khilaf about that. And, uh, 
you know, shoes and things like that. Mm -hmm. The what? Sea pigs, yeah. Khinzir al-Bahar. He, he considered it, you shouldn't eat it. But that was from the name. And a sea pig is, uh, it's a uh, seal. Yeah, it's the seal. And then also hair. And also the, uh, the down of the, uh, you know, down of the, uh, the fluff of feathers, like down. In Shafi'i Madhab, it's najis, which is why Shafi'is don't pray in like a down jacket or something like that. Whereas in Maliki, so there's a khidaf about that. And then al-jamad, anything that's, you know, like wood and rock and stone, uh, except intoxicants. So alcohol is considered najis. Uh, the milk of humans is not najis. Also, if it's not haram to eat. If it's a permissible animal, like the excrement of the permissible, if it doesn't eat najasa. So for instance, if a chicken eats najasa, then, then what comes out of it is najis. All right? It, like the, the birds, the same. If they, if they eat najasa, but normally it wouldn't be. If it's mubah, like a dove or something like that. The, um, but it's, it's mandub to wipe it off. I mean, any, anything. Because it's mustaqdar. It's something that's foul. And then also the uh, the uh, the um, the gallbladder reflux, vomit if it hasn't changed uh, the state of the food, musk and its gland, khamar that has been made into vinegar or dehydrated. You know, it's it's uh, it's, it's solid. And also alcoholic, um, you know, alcohol that's used um, for like 98 proof type that's used medicinal alcohol is not considered nejis. And my teachers from Mauritania considered um, the alcohol in, uh, in perfume to be uh, also permitted. So, I mean, because there's alternatives, I think it's better to use it. Unless, obviously, it's like a oral, if you've got, you know, if you're using it medicinally. Yeah, because then even to take herbs with alcohol that's being used medicinally is permitted. Mm -hmm. oh, so a lot of them are, yeah, and you can't drink them. I mean, you, yeah. No, I was saying that if, if that, because alcohol, people drink mouthwash to get drunk. So it is, it is alcohol, and, 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 and it is a muskir. So people should not use it unless if like a dentist prescribed it as, as a medicine to use and you didn't swallow it. But I would not use uh, alcohol, uh, mouthwash with alcohol for other than medicinal purposes. No, that's fine. Disinfectants are fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. The uh, the um, those type, like even the alcohol, you know, they have uh, uh, chocolate liquor. That's just a name. You know, there's certain things. Vanilla has alcohol. I mean, certain things. Almost everything, like all fruit drinks, have alcohol content. If if, if you actually took orange juice and analyzed it, you're going to get some percentage. But there's there's things that are ma'fu anhu. You know. You know, if, if you delve too deeply into things, the Prophet said, that they perish those who delve too deeply into things. And the Prophet didn't like that kind of obsessive, um, you know, where people went too extreme about those things. So, I mean, generally, I think a lot of that stuff, like personally, gum is, it's makru anyway, gum. Um, you know, just to chew gum, things like that. Ilq, I mean, the, the ulama mentioned that in the books that, you know, they considered it makru because it was fi'l al It was something that people that had too much time did. You know, it was kind of a, a waste of money and... Mm -hmm. Mm 
Wine vinegar is permissible. Yeah. Because it's not wine, it's vinegar, but it, it goes through a process of being wine. So once it's, إِذَا يَتَخَلَّ الْبَعْدَ الْخَمْرِ You know, it's halal. If it, once it becomes vinegar after going through the wine process, it's halal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that? Apple vinegar, all those things, they're permissible. Yeah. I mean, I think generally, yeah, everything, if it's, yeah. I mean, that's what we try to do. Yeah. I mean, it's just better quality. Yeah, tayyib, halal and tayyib. And you know, it's always in the Quran, it's halal and pure. I mean, it emphasizes pure, which even though that generally means, you know, uh, like the money, everything, the source of it. Because the food can be halal, but if you purchase it with haram money, it's not tayyib. So, but the fact that that word is such a comprehensive word, tayyib, you know, pure. So things that are pure, you know, food that's more pure. And, and when, when they sent in, in Surah Al-Kahf, when they sent them into the village, they asked him to get the purest food. You know, azka, which is like the purest food. And then also the ash of najis is not, uh, fire purifies. And the smoke. So if something's najis is burning, the smoke is not najis, even though it gets into you. The unshed blood from a slaughtered animal. So the blood that's, that's like, if you look, there's blood in the, the, the meat by the nature, but it's not flowing. That's not najis. Um, and then the, nej the najis is the dead of other than the, what was mentioned, what exits from it, what is separated from it, or the living from that which has life, blood, like a horn, bone, fingernail, hoof, tooth, quill of a feather, and skin, even if it was tanned. So, like, those, those things, if they're not um, from Mudekka. And it, it, it is permissible to use it after tanning, to store dry goods and water, and shed blood, black bile, the excrement of humans, other than, and then the excrement of, uh, you know, other than the permissible. And also the consumer, you know, anything that eats najasa. Uh, changed vomit. Sperm is considered najis. Some of the ulama say that the sperm itself is not najis, but it becomes yanjus from the, because it exits through the urethra. Like Imam Shafi was of the opinion that the basis of the human is not najis, but it becomes yanjus through the urethra. And by consensus, the Prophet uh, everything that came out of him was pure. And we know that Barakah drank his urine. I mean, that's a sound hadith. There's no. She didn't do it intentionally. She uh, she used to clean his room, and there was a bowl, and it smelled good, and she thought it was uh, something to drink, and so she drank it, and it was his urine. But uh, and she, and she said about it that that she never had a stomach ache after that. Yeah. So. But everything, and the Prophet also, they used to, when, when the Prophet went to, 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 uh, to relieve himself, they would go and it was gone. Because the, uh, the earth actually takes their, you know, takes the, the fadra of the, uh, of, the, of the Prophets. And the man drank his blood also. He, the Prophet gave, was cupped, and he gave some blood to the man. He told him to go bury it, and he took it, and he was, decided to drink it. And uh, the Prophet said the fire won't touch him because of that. And then Mehdi and Wadi. Mehdi is, is a prostatic fluid, and... Whether even though they differentiate from it because they are slightly different, it's also a, a type of prostatic fluid uh, that comes out, and they're they're both impure. So medhi is the clear, sticky that precedes the uh, um, uh, it lubricates and it precedes uh, when somebody's aroused, they get the medhi. And Sayyidina Ali asked somebody to go ask the Prophet. He said, "Kuntu rajul madha." You know, I I was you know somebody that had a lot of prostatic this fluid of Mehdi. You know, he was easily aroused and he asked the Prophet ﷺ. He asked somebody, he was too embarrassed to ask the Prophet, so he asked somebody to go and ask the Prophet about it. 
Um, so then it's considered. And then weather usually comes if if somebody uh, you know is constipated, and it, it will come after. It's like a white uh, fluid similar to semen. And then even if it is uh, permissible, and pus sadid and qayh. Qayh is pus. Sadid is exudate. So the exudate of a wound that comes out, right? Which is blood, really, isn't it? I mean, it's it's part of the the blood. The pus is the white blood cells, right? And then the sadid is the it's the um, serum of the blood. So. And then everything that flows from the body, such as scabs, uh, if it contains liquid. So if you have boils and things like that, what comes out of it is considered najis. Uh, and obviously there's, part of it is ma'fu anhu, you know, there's things that are excused just because of the difficulty. So, um, So some things cannot be purified after contact with najasa, such as meat cooked in it. So if meat was cooked in something that had najasa, then it's, you can't purify it after that. You have to just throw it out. Um, or an olive that was salted in it, uh, or an egg boiled in it, a clay pot submerged in najasa. Not if it has, there are two types of clay pots, right? There's the clay pots that are porous and they absorb, and then there's uh, glazed, it's been fired in a fern. That, that you can clean, but if a clay pot that's, that is porous and, and it gets in jasa, then it can't. Um, and then, uh, and also, you know, in this section, they, they talk about uh, the... Um, it's permissible to benefit from mutanijis, from something that's impure, like the, the hide of an animal that was not killed through zakat, if it's tanned. It's permissible, but it shouldn't be used in the masjid, right? And it shouldn't be from a human, you know, like anything used from a human. And then also that it's permissible, it's not permitted for a male adult to use silk. Now, some of the ulama permit a small amount of silk, um, but it's prohibited to do that. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited it. He allowed Zubair ibn Awam had uh, eczema, and he did allow him to use silk. So somebody's skin is very sensitive to certain types of materials, and silk is something that's uh, easier for them than it's permissible. To, uh, to wear uh, silk. Um, and also, it's not permissible to use something that is, um, that is ornamented with gold or silver. Right? So, now obviously, very small amounts of, in certain fine chinas and things, are considered, you know, it's acceptable. You know, in fine chinas, sometimes they have like a very small silver and also matli if it's uh, silver plated, things like that. But to eat from silver or gold is not permissible uh, to do that. Um, and then, but it is permissible uh, to, uh, to put it on your sword or on, a, on the mushaf. So gold uh, lettering that's done, the illuminated manuscripts that have gold lettering, that's permitted to do that. Well, like a silver mirror, you mean? Yeah, if it's very fine silver and if it's done for that reason, you know, if it's not... I mean, these things are really about extravagance, you know, and uh, extravagance in Sharia is relative. A super rich person, you know, who buys fine china, it's not necessarily considered extravagant, but if you were much more humbler means and you did the same thing, it would be considered extravagant. So... There's, there's kind of a relative approach to that, you know. But, I mean, there's people that have gold toilets and, you know, gold sinks. I mean, I've been in houses where that's the case, like literally gold. That, that's way over the top. 
And it's permissible to use gold and silver like you can use it for body parts because gold is very biocompatible as a material. So sometimes teeth, gold teeth, the bridge of the nose, you can use it um, for um, uh, also um, silver ring, right? A single silver ring. For a male, they should not wear two rings. They should only have one ring. The sunnah is is to, to have a ring with a fuss that has a stone in it. And on, on this finger or the small finger, either the left or the right, the dominant opinion is the right, but they're both they're both there. So and the Prophet uh Sallam did it's makru to wear like necklaces and things like that. If it's gold, then it's prohibited. But for men they shouldn't also piercing the ears, anything that uh I mean, some of this stuff goes back into urf, but generally th those things are prohibited. Tattoos are prohibited also. I mean, there's a strong prohibition against tattoos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you, yeah, it's permissible to wear. I mean, white gold, platinum, you know, I personally would avoid it. Just, yeah, titanium's fine. Yeah. Yeah, no, they both have proofs. They're both they both have proofs. I don't I don't know that specific thing, but they both have proofs. I mean, there's a I have a book by Imam Al Hattab. It's Ahkam Al Khawatim, the the rules relating to rings, and they go into great. If you do the wudu, you know they call it ijala. You just have to move it like that. If you do a ghusl, though, you have to take it. You have to get in where the ring is, yeah. But for the wudu, you just have to, and then if you do tayammum, you have to take it off. There can't be ha'il, it's called a ha'il. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, no, of course, yeah, yeah, it is. But, I mean, we have a problem now with, with, um, you know, filtered water now because they're starting to take sewage water and uh, and filter it. Um, that's definitely a problem. I mean, some of the ulama are against that. The what? Saliva is not najis in Maliki's madhab from dogs or pigs. Well, the water's potable. I mean, by law in the U.S., there there's a lot of regulation about uh, municipalities. So the water has to be potable. It can't be uh, dangerous. Obviously, in some areas, the content of chlorine is much higher than other areas. I mean, I wouldn't drink. There's a lot of water out there that you can taste it. It just tastes bad. Um, a lot of bottled water is just a complete scam, you know. I mean, the best types of water are like distilled water. Um, you know, you, you get good water in, like, Whole Foods has good water. So reverse um, osmosis. I mean, there's, you know, the best water is rainwater if you're in a, in a clear area. Or good river water, but also obviously, you know, there there are illnesses now. You know, especially if there's animals in the area, you can get. But I mean, I grew up drinking from stream water, so I, you know, I never, I don't ever remember getting sick. Subhanakallah, <laughs> جزا الله عنا سيدنا محمد خير ما جزيت نبيا عن أمته سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام عنه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين